I think we're allowed to start. Are we good to go, Amanda? Tansi, Egwa Tawau, Nawaku Maganak. Hello, friends. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this Nature City conversation sponsored by Wild About Saskatoon. Candice Savage Natsihatson, Grand Prairie Kiwitno Kayate Natuchin Maga, Miss Saskatoonik, Miss Saskatoon Atik Aski. Ochinia Anoch. My name is Candace Savage, and it's uh, my privilege to be the moderator tonight for our conversation. I came originally from the Peace River country in northern Alberta, but I've been living here in Saskatoon, Berry Bush land in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan for very many years. And the first thing I would like to do tonight is thank you for joining us. It's good to think of us all together apart each in our own cozy spot. I'm here with my partner Keith and too many dogs and a cat who will no doubt intrude on us in a few minutes. So please feel free to use the chat to say hello to one another and at any time to make comments or ask questions because once we've um, enjoyed the, the conversation between our two featured guests tonight, We'll open things up for your contributions and a wider discussion. So as you can maybe tell, I have been learning a little Cree, Apsis Ninoheyawan. And this is not because I have any Indigenous ancestry. I don't. So I need to acknowledge with gratitude uh, my teachers, Mrs. Ines Weenie from Sweetgrass First Nation, who teaches through the University of Saskatchewan, um, Charlotte Ross and Joseph Ne Tauhau. And I'm learning this little bit of Cree, maybe more, <laughs> as much as I can, because I'm trying to understand what it means to be a prairie person and what it means to live on Treaty 6 territory and in the homeland of the Metis Nation. Treaty 6, of course, was signed in 1876 with the primary intention on the part of the Crown of claiming the land for incomers and the primary and courageous intention on the part of the Indigenous signatories of ensuring that the people who have lived here for countless generations will be able to survive in dignity and in good health. Five years after that signing, Chief Mr. Wasis, in whose honor a bridge in Saskatoon has recently been named, found it necessary to speak to the Governor General, his nistes, his older brother, he said, about the Crown's failure to live up to the terms of the treaties. At that time, he reminded the Governor General that when the treaties were signed, it was mentioned that while the sun rose and set and the water ran, the faith in the treaties was to be kept. And the treaties, of course, were marked, the signing of the treaties were marked with a medal. And I've actually had the opportunity to hold Chief Mr. Wasis's medal in my own hands. And maybe you've seen the design of the Treaty 6 medal on one side. It shows a sunburst. On the other side, a camp of teepees. And in between, two men um, one representing the crown in a kind of military uniform and a very silly hat, and the other an Indigenous man, both male, of course, an Indigenous man looking quite ripped um, in fringes and um, feathers and regalia, um, standing there facing one another, equal size, shaking one another's hands. And we all know, living here on the prairies, how far we are from living the vision that that medal represents of equality and mutual respect and justice and connection with the land. And so that brings us to tonight's topic under the title Indigenous Persistence on the Prairies, 
rematriations, rematriation and reparations, and to guide us into this topic, to unsettle our thoughts in a good way, we're privileged to have with us two remarkable people who, among many other things, both serve on the steering committee for Indigenous Climate Action. They are Erica Violet Lee, who is a Nehiyao writer, scholar, and community organizer from inner city Saskatoon. You may have heard her as one of the celebrity guests on Canada Listens, advocating for the music of the band Crowned Lands, or you might have noticed that one of her poems, Bones, has just been nominated for a National Magazine Award. Her debut book of poetry will be published next spring by McClellan and Stewart. Michelle Brass is a writer, speaker, entrepreneur, and coach, deeply committed to the health and well being of Indigenous peoples and communities. Currently, much of her work is focused on the area of Indigenous food sovereignty and the impacts of climate change, Indigenous health and wellness, personal healing and transformation, and the empowerment of Indigenous women. She is the creator of the Shawl Program a program that trains members of Indigenous communities to become sustainable health and wellness leaders and eventually shawl certified facilitators and leads people to understand the direct relationship between the health and healing of women and the health and healing of Mother Earth and vice versa. Michelle is a proud member of Yellow Quill First Nation in Treaty 4 territory. Erica and Michelle, we are so delighted to have you with us. So I could say the floor is all yours, but the screen is all yours. So um, away you go. We're both gonna be too polite and like just not talk over each other. <laughs> Um, if you want to start, Erica, or I'm happy to either either way. So I'm sure we'll we'll have plenty to say and we'll have plenty to share <laughs> throughout this next little while. <laughs> Thank you so much, Candice, and um, everybody who was involved in uh, planning this event and inviting Michelle and I to speak. Uh, before we got started, we were saying that Michelle and I never get a chance to work together. Like we aren't asked to work together so often, and which is surprising considering we're two people in, based in Saskatchewan who do quite similar work. Um, but I think it, and it's sort of like a case of they only want one like prairie representative or whatever at the table, <laughs> one Saskatchewan Saskatchewanian and that's it. So it's kind of nice. Um, I have such deep respect for Michelle and the work that you do, um, I think is just killer. So I am going to, um, let you start, I think, because <laughs> I just, I love the work you do. And I have such <laughs> admiration for it. Um, so even just like, I'm interested in hearing more about what you're doing right now. Sure. Thank, thank you, Erica. And likewise, I feel a little fangirl on each other here for a moment. <laughs> but I, I really do. I'm so glad we're able to do this together and uh, love the work that you do and, and the work we do together as well with Indigenous Climate Action and, and how it all ties together, right? So, yeah, I'm happy to, to start this conversation. Um, uh, thank you, Candice, for that introduction and uh, to Wild About Saskatoon for inviting us to be part of this conversation. Uh, I, I, it's very close to my heart, um, to my spirit, um, for, for many, many reasons. So sometimes I do presentations that are well thought out with uh, slides and, and, you know, a whole presentation. We decided to do more of a conversational style because uh, of the first time of Eric and I presenting together, um, as well as this kind of conversation um, can, can really evolve and it, I'm interested to hear the questions afterwards um, and really have it be a relaxed conversation as opposed to like 
we're these, uh, you know, experts speaking and sharing our knowledge. Um, it's just nice to share some stories, some experiences, um, some thoughts, and then I'm definitely open to questions. Um, because I think this is important for it to be a conversation. I think it's important for us to have, uh, indigenous voices, um, women's voices uh, in these conversations, um, but that they are conversations and not just presentations being spewed out, that we all collectively play a role in all of the work that needs to be done. So um, I uh, am a member of the Eloquo First Nation in Treaty 4 territory uh, and lived many years in Saskatoon. And I think it's important, Candice, you had mentioned in the beginning of the introduction of Saskatoon being situated in Treaty 6 and doing an acknowledgement of that territory and also mentioning that um, Treaty 6 was signed in 1876. And I think it's also important to remember what also was signed in 1876, and that being the Indian Act. And I'm bringing this up in this context because I think it's important to remember when we talk about Indigenous persistence on the prairies and the rematriation um, and reclamation of lands and reparations that need to be made, that we really need to understand how we got here and, and why we're here and the whole purpose of it all. And so we'll often talk about treaties being signed in um, this lovely agreement between our nations, between our peoples to share the land. And yes, there was a lot of prayer. There was a lot of intention put behind those agreements. It's also important to remember that at the same time that these treaties were being negotiated, that there were laws being drafted in place to remove Indigenous peoples from the lands and territories in which we inhabited for, for millennia and had a deep relationship with for a very different purpose. Uh, and that is to access lands for resources, for the use, for the taking, to build a completely different society. And so as the treaties were being negotiated and signed, um, what, what is now Canada and that government was drafting legislation to actually incarcerate Indigenous peoples onto reserve, to strip us from our languages, strip us from our culture. So we have to know that this was happening at the same time because there is this Canadian cultural myth of Canada being the good one. You know, it wasn't like in the U.S. with the Indian Wars. It was, it was peaceful, but it was not. It was very purposeful to, um, the purpose of the treaties was to peacefully and quickly remove Indigenous peoples from the land so that the uh, Canadian government could access, or the British government at the time, and then the Canadian government um, access those lands and, and to build a society. And so we talk about unsettling um, thoughts and to really talk about what it means. It requires honesty about our history um, and the purposefulness behind actions and legislation that was put forward. So I think it's really clear that we need to really talk about the realities of we have two completely different worldview points of, of different peoples living on these lands. And when we talk about things like we, like reparations, um, reconciliation, what does that really mean? So I'm just going to get right down to it because we only have an hour. We only have a few minutes. And so I was also told that the people who are attending are like ready to be unsettled. So I'm just going to cut to it. And when we talk about especially um, urban Indigenous peoples, um, accessing lands, having, you know, you have to remember how did we get here purposely removed so that the Canadian government could have access to these lands for resources, for agricultural, uh, industrial farming, uh, for settlement, for oil and gas mining, for gold, for forestry, for whatever, whatever natural resource could be extracted a um, hundred years ago and then 50 years ago and today and what can continue to be extracted. The end goal is still to extract as much as many resources as possible for the benefit of the greater Canadian society as Indigenous peoples suffer in our own homelands and territories, struggle to um, reclaim our languages, to access our ancestral foods for our health and well-being, while we see our animal relatives die, while we see the suffering of the water, of the soils, all of these things continuing to happen. Um, so I think it's just important to understand that it was purposely done. And so we have people living in an urban setting and how are we going to repair or reclaim that? It's really a mindset issue and a power issue. It's a, it's a conversation that requires discussions around white supremacy, around whose mindset uh, takes precedent over other worldviews and mindsets and how we operate on the land. And so when I think about reconciliation and reparations and having access to our lands, who is in control of the land and to what purpose and, and when will that ever be relinquished? And to be honest, if we're going to talk about reconciliation, it will require 
white Canadians or mainstream Canadians, Canadian citizens to be willing to relinquish power. That's decision-making power over lands, how the, how they're used, uh, to what purpose. And mostly what I'm seeing is surface level reconciliation. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of dressing up of reconciliation, but what it is is about the land. So Treaty 6 was signed in 1876, Indian Act signed in 1876, one to, you know, say, we'll share the land, the other to remove Indigenous peoples from the land. And now he, here we are in urban settings, accessing land, still having this fight. So I can continue to go on, but I actually um, want to just touch it, touch in so I don't go too far. But Eric, if you wanted to jump in or, you know, feel free, like, it doesn't have to be me presenting for 15 and you, but we can just kind of back and forth go on this. But I just wanted to start um, that we really have to understand our history and be really clear about what we're dealing with that it isn't this like really nice shiny history and I think we know that um but to be really clear on that and then what do we do today right and so people say okay this is what's happened but what are we doing today right and so um we talked before this presentation about like how can urban life support indigenous language revitalization culture well-being um because this presentation is being hosted by wild about saskatoon and talking about an urban indigenous experience accessing lands um i do have ideas on that but just before we get to that i just know if, erica if you wanted to chime in with anything on that topic before i moved on to actually like practical <laughs> things after addressing um, you know, the reality of, of power uh, and decision-making power over lands. Yeah, thank you, Michelle. That's an um, awesome way to start. It's funny, like, <clears throat> I didn't even realize that um, I knew when Treaty 6 was signed and I knew when the Indian Act was and I didn't put it together until you just, like, pointed it out. So that's pretty messed up. <laughs> um <laughs> Yeah, treaties are so complicated. Like growing up in the prairies, um, I was taught by elders and teachers about the importance of the intent of the treaties and the importance that like even though they were imperfect, uh, an imperfect situation um, driven by colonialism, um, that Indigenous folks still tried their best to advocate for those of us who would come after and um, that the importance of like honoring that idea and that dream um, while still recognizing actually it's a really flawed system and not something we can, I think, actually move forward with as a framework in the sense that um, I believe that the treaties as they exist currently don't do enough to account for our relationalities that as Michelle was discussing with other creatures other than human creatures um I don't think that there is enough of a framework in there there's not enough indigenous philosophy in that framework to account for our relationalities with like black folks who are um who have been like they have their own histories of being violently removed and violently resettled um, onto like our homelands. Um, and uh, yeah, and I also loved that Candace brought up the, I, as soon as I think of that treaty medal, I always think about the fact that it's two dudes shaking hands and it cracks me up um, because it's, it's like, this is, this is the iconography of what our entire like, being is supposed to be and it's like it doesn't represent me <laughs> like, <laughs> right like I understand the intent and I understand the, how hard our ancestors worked for us and that I will never take for granted um, it, given the impossible situation that they were in um, but even today that legacy of like gendered violence against indigenous women girls two-spirit people queer people and trans folks is so deeply embedded with colonialism and racism. Those things never exist separately. They're always part and parcel of the same um, mentalities, of the same imbalanced relationship to the world that we live in. Um, since we're talking about the prairies, I was thinking while Michelle was speaking, about some conversations I've had recently with friends 
um, thinking about the differences and the similarities, the parallels and resistance that we can build in our work um, to like, so like living in an urban setting in the prairies like Saskatoon or Regina or Winnipeg or Edmonton or Calgary, there's a very specific like lived experience of being racialized um, and as Indigenous on the prairies. And it is really violent and it's very explicit and overt. Um, but at the same time, I'm so grateful for having grown up here and having made a home here because everywhere I look, um, there are people who look like me um, live in their lives. And I think that it gives, gives, gave me a sense of belonging. It gave me a sense of um, strength. And um, I like the, the title of this talk persistence rather than resilience because we're always pegged as resilient right which is such a like um weird term and such a problematic term to call people like oh you're so resilient like thanks I don't want to have to be but I kind of have to be like I don't really have a choice <laughs> we don't have a choice it's either be resilient or die uh, that sounds so doomy. I make things sound so doomy, but it is doomy. Colonialism is about, um, and the way it functions is about taking our lives from out from under us. Like it's that serious, and we live with that knowledge every day. Um, so yeah, it's serious. And to that note, um, on so like on knowing your history as such an important part of moving forward, or an important part of building something greater, um, better, more like softer for, for all of us, because this system isn't healthy for anybody. It's not, it's not like good for white Canadians either. It's, it's capitalism isn't good for anybody. <laughs> like, um, it's especially not good for black and indigenous people, but, um, definitely it's not a healthy system to live in. Um, with so much emphasis on policing and prisons right now in the prairies, especially in Saskatchewan, it's just a mess here. Um, and as an organizer who is drawn more and more towards organizing in that sphere, recognizing like the histories that have contributed to indigenous people and black folks being incarcerated at ridiculous rates or at all um and uh being policed constantly like there were like five cop cars on my street in Saskatoon all day today and that's kind of what it's like most of the time um they're just always around and the psychological and the physical impacts material impacts that that presence has um is deep and profound and traumatizing. Um, and I know that like most people in my community have experiences with the cops and with the, with prisons, with the carceral system that is deeply negative. Um, that is not about healing in any way that is not about repair. Um, and so I've taken my lead from a lot of <clears throat> my, um, a lot of Black community members and thinkers who discuss um, abolition as like the only possible route towards something better. So the idea that um, the system we have right now doesn't fix things, it doesn't repair, it doesn't uh, restore justice, it doesn't create balance, um, it just creates more sickness. Uh, so that's the kind of organizing that I am working on right now in the prairies or in Saskatoon more specifically. Um, and I think I've seen this conversation was so important for me to attend today because I've seen not a lack of interest, but a lack of, I've seen oppressive conditions worsening. Um, which create so much exhaustion in people who really genuinely want to see a better world. And everyone I know is so burnt out. 
So whoever's out there right now, like we're, rec- we're recruiting you today, basically. <laughs> like we we need you. We need everybody in this um, for a better world for all of us. It's like that simple. I'm so glad you brought all of that up. Like burnout in our movements is so prevalent right now. There are so many people I've been talking to about deep burnout as a result of colonization and capitalism, the extractive nature of our entire society on our lands, on our bodies, on our relatives, Um, not just our people relatives, but the land, the animals, the soils, all of all of that in our kinship systems and how we relate to one another. And the exhaustion is real and deep. And you know, there's this whole thing of like, well, you know, going back to the land and the land will heal us. And we know that. And and it's not so easy. It's it's because we've been so dispossessed and we've been so forcibly removed. I mean, we have always been incarcerated in our own lands. We were incarcerated onto reserves um, to make way for settlement, to make way for resource extraction. And that continues to happen um, right up, right um, in, in all across the prairies, in the cities and in rural areas all the time. Um, and I think it's really important to understand that. And those of us who are standing up there is this deep exhaustion this deep level which is why it leads it's all interconnected climate work and and healing justice work and um all the work that you do erica and you know and we talk about self-care and community care but it's like it's so systemic and and it was this sick society this society that is unhealthy to us as humans who who there's so much more that we're supposed to do in our lives and so much that we're supposed to enjoy. Um, And it seems so elusive because of the grind (laughs) that has been imposed upon us and that we are forced to partake in in order to exist. Uh, It does get really exhausting. And so um, I do a lot of talk uh, and a lot of the work that I had, I had gotten burned out really quick and I had seen predecessors, um, people that are really admired and mentors, dropping and dropping and dropping in in the climate movement in the environment movement in in all and they're all i mean these aren't separate movements they're all the same movement they are all interconnected it's just the different avenues the different ways in which we engage in that work um academics and and um, activists and all of these it's all part of the work and and we do get burnt out and so really looking at how we can revitalize kinship systems and meaning just supporting one another, but also supporting the lands and getting back there. And so this whole idea of healing and getting back to that and healing um, and, and getting that support. So there's a few things I want to talk about, but one thing, Eric, that you mentioned about, like, we need some help where we're going to recruit everybody out there. Like, again, it's about like, who has power, who has energy. And so as Indigenous peoples, we don't have a choice. We don't have a choice but to survive and to work um, for our families, our children, our grandchildren, for the water, for the animals, for the plants, for our medicines, for all of it. And and so we can take these rest breaks, but it's it's there is no true respite or respite from from the work that we need to do. And so I go back again to like who are who are the people in positions of power and privilege, and and there's so much that we're needing right now. So when you talk about um, reparations, um, how to because I hear this from a lot of people, and it, this is a very different um way of presenting so i've never presented i I want to address the technology here a little bit because uh, we're using google meet that i believe is being broadcast onto youtube so i can't actually see who's here so i feel like i'm just speaking out into the the ether here (laughs) like who is out there listening and usually i see i make eye contact engage with people or even on other technology where there's more interaction directly in the chat and stuff like that i can kind of get a sense of Who's here? Who's, you know, who am I speaking with and conversing with to have this conversation with? Um, So just bear with me as I, as I share these ideas, but we are asking for people to come. And uh, for those of there, there's, I've heard from a lot of people like, what can we do? How can we help? You know, okay. I've learned about the history and it's awful. And there's this sense of, I want to do something. And even Candace sharing and speaking Cree, you know, and I have such mixed feelings about that because on one hand, I'm like, yes, it's so great. I can hear you speaking Cree. And we were all forced to learn English and French and, and, and other languages in some cases, but you know, that our languages are stripped from us and then imposed upon us. It's great to hear that. And then I think about all of the indigenous peoples who can't speak that. Like I I it's both inspiring and heartbreaking at the same time. And our languages are so important because the languages. Uh, uh, Anishinaabe or, or Nakawe and Naheo, Cree, they all have 
the the blueprint or the view, the world view that is necessary right now. So as Indigenous peoples, we were given original instructions as to how to live on these lands in kinship with one another. And a lot of that viewpoint is embedded in the language. And so language revitalization is about uh, reparations, um, rematriation, all of this, as well as um, the healing, uh, climate action, all of it is, is tied into that as well. Um, but but what we need is is that is is more represent people willing to learn our worldview to understand what is it that we're talking about when we say all my relations in the translated into English. What does that really mean? What do terms like Wakotuin and kinship and being together? What do they really mean? Um, so that kind of work is really important. The other kind of work that's really important is literally getting out there and putting your bodies uh, in place of like where we are, where where to stand with us, not to help us not to save us, but to be in solidarity with us because we already know what we need. We have our teeth, like we're learning, we're, we're bringing that back. Um, but to, to be supportive, not, not savior. So there's that. And I really bring up the mindset and the power issues because there are organizations that are doing things. So um, there was a award ceremony this morning uh, in Regina for projects that have, um, sustainability built into them um, and some really great ideas, really good work that's being done. Um, and, and then there's projects, um, for example, and it, it may apply to some areas of Saskatoon, but there's a treaty land sharing network, for example, which is a newer organization about a year old where landowners throughout the prairies are opening up their land to provide access to indigenous peoples for medicine gathering, for access for, for whatever purposes, hunting, for fishing, for gathering of ceremony, uh, resource, like um, the, the elements that we would need to conduct our ceremonies, uh, things like that. But it's interesting because it was meant in a re in response to the trespassing laws that had come in. And we talked about policing and the incarceration and the criminalization of indigenous peoples just existing as we always have in our traditional territories, you know, and these new trespassing laws that again, further uh, restrict us from accessing our territories for food procurement, for accessing our medicines, for the things that we are meant to do uh, outside of capitalism, um, living, right? But they have been criminalized. And um, and so so we need to dismantle that. But then there's conversely this other group that's like, okay, well, what can we do in response? We're going to open our land. You know what's interesting, is, I, which is great. And I have deep respect for everybody involved in that. And I'm going to challenge you to do even better and to continue to look into your hearts and your minds about your mindset and your approach because all of this is about how we are behaving and our unconscious programming as to how we view ourselves as inferior superior helpers helping the oppressed these things need to be unpacked and dismantled because if we don't it's going to continue to perpetuate this so as indigenous peoples we're on the land we're on the streets we're in our homes we're on the reserves we're doing the work as best we can as people who are landowners or people in positions of power okay so the tree land should opening up that land but what was coming up was that people would say okay they can access the land, but I, I want a relationship. I want like I want people to call me and say, okay, this, you know, come in for coffee and then let me know what you're gonna do on the land. And I'm not saying that you don't have a right to know, like if there's danger places. I'm, what I'm challenging is the mindset of one, it's transactional. So it's saying, okay, you can access the land, but I want to have a relationship because I want to feel good about what I'm doing. Like check your intentions. Are you opening it up because it's the right thing to do? Or are you doing because you want to feel like you're a good person doing the right thing to contribute to reconciliation? And it's really important to look inside and find out what that intention is. And I'm not saying that that's necessarily a bad intention, but you need to be aware of it because you can unwittingly cause harm because we are exhausted because we're reclaiming our languages we're trying to keep our kids educated in, in regular capitalist society as well as learning the medicines on the land and preparing them for climate chaos and and the chaos to come like <laughs> we're dealing with suicide epidemics we're dealing with like all the things and we're exhausted and so if you're saying well you can come and access the land but i want to have a relationship like that's exhausting because then we have to go sit down and probably educate you and tell you about the issues meanwhile being accused that we are get, like benefiting from free education from the treaties meanwhile providing a free education to people who mean well and want to learn and telling them the dates of everything that are occurring so they understand the history so a lot of it is about regular Canadians looking at how you're showing up 
and behaving. And I know that I'm not making a lot of friends and that's okay because I have like deeper issues that we need to address. But if you want to be unsettled, like, okay, let's have a conversation and, and we can do that. So there was the transactional, like, let's have coffee. There was the other thing like, okay, but I want to know when, who, what, and, and again, it's okay, but let's go deeper. It's about power. So it was people saying, yes, you can access the land, but I'm still in charge. So is it an equal sharing? It's like, no, I'm going to let you into my yard uh, under these hours and you can take this and not that. That's not really sharing because meanwhile, our traditional territories are being like mined and the water's being sucked up and the soil's being depleted. And so I'm bringing these up because I think it's really important when we have these conversations about reconciliation, reparation, rematriation, we need to get really real about who's in charge, who's got the power and privilege, and who is truly willing to relinquish that. And I would bet no Canadian is ever going to be ready to relinquish any power because I see it at the federal, provincial, municipal, rural government levels. And I see it with individual landowners who will talk the talk and be willing to do it. But when it really comes to putting any skin in the game, it's like, nope, because there's a fear that we're going to do to you what maybe you've done to us. And I think deep down Canadians know that and there's a fear. And so we need to get real about these conversations and stop putting pretty bows on things and, and making it look nice on the surface. And in reality, we're still dying. We're still getting burnt out. We're still losing our languages at a rapid rate. Our children are still committing suicide. We are literally dying on our lands. And we're just asking regular Canadians to like really look into yourselves and your hearts and be like, what role do I play? And what truly am I willing to give up? It requires being vulnerable. So if we're going to have these conversations. Let's really have these conversations because the government's not going to change it. All the papers, all the studies, it's going to be real people on the ground, grassroots. If you're willing to put your body on the line and if you're willing to put your land on the line, then we can have these conversations that go beyond um, like, headline pretty stories that we can share to feel good about one another. <laughs> Sorry, that was a bit boxy, but I think it's important in this conversation in the title that we've got to really get real about the relationships and the dynamic, the power dynamic when we're talking about policing and we're talking about um, industrial agriculture and we're talking about city policy and fences that keep people out and the policies about how we can access land and I'll give an example about being on the prairies and in Saskatchewan um, I think it was like Canada Day like it was like ironic it was so my mom and I so my mom lives in the Lost Heights area of Saskatoon and we're down by the river right dad just down from the wastewater treatment plant and um Anyway, we're, we're, there's berries. There's Saskatoon berries there. And I'm like, hey, let's pick some berries because I do all the food sovereignty work and stuff. I'm like, ah, we didn't eat them because like they, they, they were spraying. But we were picking berries and people walked by and they were looking at us and whispering. And one of them said, what are they doing? And so I was like, I don't know. I think they're picking berries. And they're like, is that even legal? And it's like, I don't care if it's legal. We're doing it. This is like the Saskatoon River Bank. And we've been here and we have the right. And we picked the berries. I don't think we ate them. We washed them. But I was really concerned about the spraying and the health of the berries. But again, it's this mindset of controlling how we behave in every single setting, whether it's rural or urban. Is that even legal? And again, it's the criminalization of Indigenous life. And... Erica knows it. She lives it. She knows it in her bones that I can tell. And we can feel it. And I feel it. But I don't think regular Canadians really, truly know what it feels like to be on the prairies trying to do all of this work and constantly being criminalized for it or suspected of being criminals for something like picking berries. And that's like the littlest example. So again, it's these little mindset things. That's such a killer story oh my gosh um uh yeah it really does come down to that berry doesn't it and it's it's so funny because it's like that's our law that's our relationality with the land that's our history that's um you know it's just plain life living life picking berries like the most innocuous but actually meaningful act um you could take part in um especially in a place that's named after that berry um still <laughs> um 
yeah, that's beautiful. Um, but also like, I totally, oh man. Um, and with the burnout thing and like, um, sort of being aware of constantly being policed and constantly, um, being under the gaze of colonialism. Um, it like, it really does, um, alter the way that you are able to live your life and interact with the world and interact with other people. Um, because, uh, yeah, it's just such a, it's messed up. It's a messed up relationality. And Franz Fanon, who's one of my favorite, uh, theorists, if you're into like decolonial theory, um, he was Algerian and French and he wrote about, um, being a psychiatrist during the French Algerian war and seeing the impacts of colonialism on a lot of these black men, Algerian men who were, um, fighting in the war and that's when he sort of came to the realization oh colonialism like has physical consequences on the lives of people who are colonized and it's violence um and uh his his solution which is still very controversial um to people is that um because colonization is such a violent act that um our our resistance to it and the way that we, um, the only way that we are often able to stand up in the face of it is by doing something that may be viewed as violent um, by people. And so like a lot of people think that, um, and as Michelle said, a lot of people think that just like our existence as indigenous is like a violent, like trespassing act, right? And we saw this like, clear as day with Colton Bushy. Um, we saw this um, with Neil Stonechild, with um, all of the missing and murdered Indigenous girls, women, two-spirit, and trans folks who are um, just viewed as sort of like, um, I, I know that there's a category that police will write down and say like, this person just probably wandered away or whatever. And it's like, what a what a thing to say like people don't just wander away from their communities from their families from their lives um but because we're indigenous we're seen as somehow being just like totally lawless which is the opposite of the truth because we have actually very um complex and meaningful systems of governance that we still enact in our daily lives despite colonialism's attempts to destroy them. So I really appreciated that berry picking story. <laughs> um, I wonder, I, I don't know what time we're supposed to start doing if there's any questions or anything, because I think we have like 15 ish minutes left. So I don't know if you want to. I'm like, absolutely open for, yeah, to, to hear where people are at and where mm -hmm. they have or, or where, where they're engaging. And I can't see too much in the chat here, so I'm going to leave this to, to Candace and the team. <laughs> so, Amanda, um, here I am again. Um, I have, well, thank you for all this truth telling. It's impossible <laughs> to respond to. Um, you know, my heart is full, and I know that there are 100 other or 200 other people listening who who are feeling the same way, feeling the same kind of grief and anger and recognition. Um, these are, of course, there there aren't step, ten steps solutions. Um, so maybe I'll just ask you for definition of terms. You've used in your title the word rematriation. Every time I type that. Spellcheck helpfully replaces it with repatriation. What do you mean? What's rematriation? What what possible repair can there be? And if we think specifically of this city, how do we rematriate this land it, that now is occupied by the city of Saskatoon so that it supports all of us, but specifically supports 
indigenous people and indigenous cultures and languages. Um, I think that, um, I, I don't remember, but um, I, I've talked about this before. Um, the, where I originally heard the term was from uh, the Rumatriate Collective. Um, and it's like uh, this group of, uh, I guess it's, yeah, rematriate.org. I just want to make sure. Um, no, I can't, and I, I'm not sure if even the original um, website is up still, but um, in, I'd say like the early 2000s, this collective of indigenous women um, in the country started this project to say like, actually, because everyone was talking about repatriation and um, bringing back things that were stolen, not lost, stolen, um, and getting back to um, what, what was interrupted, the processes of our lives that were interrupted by colonialism. Um, and so rematriating kind of flips that, flips that um, treaty dude handshake on the treaty six medal and says like actually we um have have and had our own laws and they were a lot more um gender inclusive they were a lot more um queer they were a lot more they were and are a lot more queer and less um less patriarchal than the systems that were so often exposed to even in like decolonial theory it's so often like very masculine and um uh one of the valid critiques of fanon um not to get too academic and in, into the stuff or whatever but that's what i do <laughs> um one of the valid critiques of fanon would be to say like actually um in cree teachings um, there's the circle, the circle teachings, and in the center of the circle are people who are made most vulnerable or who are most who are most most vulnerable, um, and people who need to um, have that extra protection from the warriors, whoever that might be, not necessarily gender specific, right? Um, but uh, yeah, it's just a disruption of the way that patriarchy genuinely believes that it can fix the world by using the same principles that it broke the world with. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. how I do it anyway. I don't know. Maybe Michelle has a different take. Uh, no, actually, you know, I, I'm just coming into this term um, more, more recently uh, than you for sure. And so I've just really taken it as uh, really more women's voices um, and really reclaiming that, um, you know, as a pushback and, and not that of course we don't love and respect our men, um, very deeply, um, but that there is an imbalance and that there was very much that um, the decision-making power, right? And and I, and I think, yeah, the, the, the treaty medal, it just goes to, you know, like in the stories of that, the treaty negotiators would only negotiate with men and like, and, and just the racism that's been embedded into the Indian Act. Um, and you look at the missing murdered Indigenous women, two spirit and all of our people, like, all, like all of these things, again, interconnected. So really uplifting uh, women's voices, um, you know, you know, understanding the crossover of of food sovereignty work, of um, birthing, uh, plant, med you know, our medicines, uh, like all of the healing, all of these voices. Um, so when I take that, it's it's just really reclaiming that role um, and the teachings and the knowledge behind that. So I heard somebody um, speaking the other day about the whole idea of extinguishment of title and linking that to a belief that the home fires, which were women's responsibility that the, the fires had been extinguished. So rematriation is a big part of recovery then. I still don't know what it would look like in this city, but anyway, Emily Eaton has a question for you. Is there literature about the tensions between recognizing and affirming the true spirit and intent of treaties and abolition? Are they in opposition to one another? No small questions tonight. 
That's, a, that's an intense question. And I guess since I talked about abolition a bit, I can just quickly say, um, I don't think that I have read, I don't think I've come across anything like that. And it's interesting um, within, I think, Indigenous scholarship and Indigenous communities um, were only like it's been around for a while, obviously, like discussions of abolition and um, over over the idea of prison reform or prison policing reform um, and the impossibility of reforming a system that's so inherently violent. Um, but uh, in terms of literature or scholarship, it's all very new. And uh, but yeah, I don't know. We should write something together on it, Emily. <laughs> That would be such a powerhouse <laughs> book, I think. Yeah, and and it's so important, really. I, I love I love this because yeah, there isn't anything that I've come across, um, but but I it's necessary and it's definitely something that really needs to be explored and unpacked. So you yeah, both mentioned. Sorry, go ahead, Erica. Oh, I was just going to say, in terms of the oppositionality, um, I don't think I think something that I've come to realize over the last few years is that um, things can exist um, in different ways at once. Like there, there can be different worlds existing at once. Um, so I don't think that they're necessarily in opposition, although maybe like on a surface level, it might appear that way. You both talked about burnout, which I think is something that's familiar to anybody who cares about the disaster state of the living world. Um, what is the importance of pleasure in the work you do? I don't know, but I just saw both of us light up at the same time. I think as soon as you asked that question. Finally, good. Let's talk about the good stuff. <laughs> Oh, really? yeah, I think it is vital. It is it is vital. To, I was just having this conversation this afternoon um, with a uh, with with a friend who's involved in climate work um, at the academic level um, about, you know, we were talking about burnout and recovery and rest. And, and there's even this idea of like rest, but rest so that you can be productive again in the capitalist society. And I'm like, that is no, no, like that is not what we do. <laughs> we need to rest for rest sake. And there's like there's the NAP ministry um, in the U.S. that's uh, headed by a black woman about because of the uh, of the violence and the oppression of black women bodies in particular um, and the desire and the need for rest. But pleasure and joy and there's books being written on it. Um, and I can't remember there, like there was um, what is it? Mil Joyful militancy and pleasure. pleasure activism and yeah and these books and I think like it is such an affront to, to an oppressive extractive uh industry and society and mentality to have that but it's also our natural state of being I mean like the 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 land and the waters and our our languages and our kinship like all of it, like so pleasure is is actually the program that I was talking about that I do that is about healing and healing justice and all this has pleasure at, at the core of it um because we are so burnt out but yet there's so much humor and joy and I just find like I need to keep filling my cup the work is super heavy and so I have to find every day ways of doing it and there's big ways and little ways and it's not i'm not talking about entertainment I, I don't view joy and pleasure as entertainment or a distraction from the world it's about really feeding myself so pleasure of the mind and and talking about ideas the pleasure and joy of connection with another human being or with my animal relatives and and really feeling that connection so walking the land um, i do something called dance and journey dance uh, which isn't this is part of the conversation, but it's all interconnected. And it's all about human connection, being seen by another person, feeling joyful in the body, um, pleasure in the body. And again, this is an important conversation too, especially with the um, the violence and the sexual violence in particular against Indigenous women and our innate sexuality that is made so taboo, but is such a key component of living a pleasurable full life in our bodies as they age in all stages of life to really talk about that, all of the teachings. So I could, I could go on about pleasure and joy um, <laughs> there because of the time, because I'm sure she's got lots to share too. And it's so multifaceted. 
<laughs> yeah, I feel the same way as Michelle. Um, and I think that we are all sort of coming to this space where we realize that like um, to in order to rematriate, in order to create um, spaces that nourish us, uh, in order to heal, in order to have the energy to fight back, but also to have something to fight for, um, you have to nurture um, your spirit and um in ways that are deep not like uh, and you know, that can look like anything right it can it, it depends on like what you're passionate about and so that's something that i really advocate to like all of the younger indigenous folks in my life and racialized folks in my life um is find what you love and like do that because that's something that colonialism and capitalism take away from us or try to take away from us is um, like you can't, we can't be resistant all the time. We can't, that's not a human existence. Like that's not a way for a human to flourish. Um, as Michelle said at the beginning of the talk that um, there's more to life than just survival and there has to be. Otherwise, we lose sight of why we're fighting. We lose fight. We lose sight of what it is like that's so beautiful that is actually worth the fight and going to be worth it in the end. So yeah, every single day, do what you love. Yeah. Um, another, uh, another person. We haven't even been able yet to talk about plants. Speaking of things we love. But someone, just before we leave, someone would appreciate your recommendations about books that will help them understand the huge and horrific impact of colonization on Indigenous populations within Canada. Do you have a bibliography in your mind? A couple things perhaps that are most visceral or useful. Um, the first book that comes to my mind is Chelsea Vowell's Indigenous Rights, like rights as in R, wait, W-R-I-T-E-S. Um, and it's a, she wrote it and designed it specifically as like a primer for Canadians, white Canadians, um, or any Canadians, I guess, who identify as Canadians to um, answer all those questions that like you don't learn the answers to in school that none of us did learn about in school right um so that would be my one and she also cites a ton of other books in that book so um yeah and i would recommend um james dashik and i know he's not an indigenous writer but clearing the plains i think that's a really 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 important one to understand um because it ties into so much of what i'm talking about here about clearing the plains for access for resource extraction and how that has impacted all of these areas of language incarceration climate um climate crisis all of it um displacement um so i would do that one and and really there's so many um it's interesting because it's also there's there's academic books there's um research you know, those types of there's also the personal stories like it's all important right and even something really as simple like introductory as like lee markle's uh, conversations with canadians and a lot of her books as well i found very um helpful in the evolution of my growth in this area um but it, it depends on where you want to start but it's all important. It's 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 the heavy books on the brutality and the reality and the horrific history of of colonization in these lands. But then it's also understanding um, the the personal stories. Uh, so yeah, but I would start with those two anyway. The one that Erica and then and that one as a starting point. Um, but really just start reading them, Pick, read as much as you can by indigenous authors. Um, show up, listen listen, listen, um, and, and seek it out and then uplift those voices as well. Share them, um, you know, passing the mic, all of that kind of stuff is really important too. So Chelsea Vowles, Indigenous Rights, James Daschuk, um, Clearing the Plains, and anything by Lee Miracle. 
That's what I think was was that the list for for a beginning. How How much time do you have when you go through our whole library? For a beginner, for a beginning. Yeah. Um, This amazingly has brought us to the end of our hour. Um, And um, there are many people, you can't see all the comments, but many thank yous um, coming in, uh, which I would like to redouble. I'm very grateful to both of you for all this truth telling and um well leaving us leaving us with so much to think about um i'd like to um thank amanda farnell who has been laboring in the back um um trying to give me prompts so that i'll start speaking at the same time right time and so on um with the saskatchewan festival of words she's been um, handling all the technical aspects um rachel mckenzie from wild about Saskatoon has also been um, troubleshooting. Um, the city of Saskatoon provided Wild About Saskatoon with an environmental grant that helped to pay for this project, this program tonight. So we're very grateful for that as well. Um, please check us out on our website. You will find um, uh, invitations to go and visit places around the city where you can feel the heartbeat of the land a little bit. Um, a podcast, um, more conversations um, from the past, um, and just oh yes, and then and and a whole lot of information about making friends with the plants that belong here um, through our pollinator paradise project. Thank you all very very much for joining us, um, and thank you again and always and forever, Erica. And Michelle. Muestas Mina. Thank you very much. And um, we'll see you again soon. Thank Good you. Night. Good night. Thank you.